Hello everyone, Dark of All Trades here. Due to the popularity of the last video, I decided to make another one. The second poll on my channel showed a bit more decisively that you would like to see my take on the argument from religious experience. Thank you to all who voted, and I'll put up another poll this week. So let's dive into an extended academic exploration of the argument from religious experience. Buckle up, we're about to dissect this argument in its strongest form, with a dash of wit, a sprinkle of humor, and an unwavering commitment to scholarly rigor. The mission today is twofold, to dissect the argument from religious experience with the precision of a philosophical scalpel, and to do so with a sparkle of intellectual mirth. As we navigate the contours of personal testimony, we shall unravel the threads that bind our subjective encounters to the woven tapestry of objective knowledge. We shall embark on this quest for clarity, asking whether personal experiences alone can indeed serve as an unassailable foundation for universal truths. Are these subjective encounters the bedrock of irrefutable knowledge, or might they lead us astray into the bewildering forest of confirmation bias? But fear not, for our guides on this academic expedition shall be humor and wit. A well-placed jest, a clever analogy, or a witty rejoinder, these shall accompany us as we navigate the depths of complex philosophical waters. Laughter, after all, is the seasoning of intellect, the companion of reflection, and the balm for the weary philosophical traveler. And so, with our minds sharpened and our spirits enlivened, we embark on this quest to dissect, analyze, and perhaps illuminate the argument from religious experience. The argument from religious experience is considered by some as a compelling piece of evidence for the existence of a higher power. Here's the strongest form of the argument in all of its glory. 1. Many individuals across different cultures and times report having profound religious experiences. 2. These experiences often involved a direct encounter or sense of connection with a divine being, presence, or transcendent reality. 3. These experiences are typically described as highly meaningful, life-changing, and deeply convincing to those who undergo them. 4. Since these experiences are reported by a wide range of people and are consistent in their description of a divine or transcendent reality, they should be taken seriously as evidence of the existence of such a reality. Sounds robust, right? Well, let's break it down premise by premise. Let's start with premise one, a crowd favorite, no doubt. It boldly claims that many folks from various corners of the world and throughout history have reported their profound religious experiences. A compelling start, wouldn't you say? But let's not be too quick to roll out the red carpet for this premise. The sheer quantity of reports, while impressive, can sometimes lead us astray. Remember when everyone thought disco was the future of music? Well, here's the logical fallacy. We find ourselves dancing the argumentum et populum tango. A fancy way of saying that just because many people are doing it doesn't necessarily make it right. Popularity isn't always a reliable indicator of truth. So, while the reports of these experiences certainly pique our interest, we mustn't let the sheer number of them blind us to the critical question. Is quantity truly a measure of quality when it comes to determining the existence of the divine? Or might we be waltzing down a logical path strewn with glittering but misleading disco balls? But hang on, for we have more premises to disco... I mean, dissect. Now moving to premise two. We find ourselves in the intriguing realm of direct divine encounters, a spiritual tete-a-tete, if you will. It suggests that these profound religious experiences are akin to having a cup of tea with a divine being, feeling a sense of connection with the transcendent, or perhaps sharing a celestial chat over brunch. While it certainly sounds captivating, let's not forget our critical thinking hats. The logical pitfall here might remind you of a magician's trick. Now you see it, now you don't. This premise ventures into the territory of post hoc ergo propter hoc, a tongue twister that essentially means assuming causation simply because one thing follows another. Just because someone experiences a deep sense of connection or encounter with what they think is the divine after a series of cosmic events, even granting the divine exists, does that mean that the events were necessarily caused by the divine? It's a bit like saying, I ate chocolate cake, and then it rained, so chocolate cake must be a rain summoning ritual. You see the delicious flaw in that logic. So while the idea of sipping tea with the divine is charming, we must remember that correlation doesn't necessarily imply causation. The waters of this argument may be deeper than they appear, and we're here to navigate them with logic and, of course, a pinch of humor. Let's explore the next premise of this intriguing argument. Premise 3 takes us on a journey into the heart of personal transformation, a metamorphosis prompted by these profound religious experiences. It claims that those who undergo these experiences often find them as meaningful as a Shakespearean soliloquy, as life-changing as a plot twist in a blockbuster movie, and as convincing as your friend's insistence that pineapple belongs on pizza. But before we dive headfirst into this transformational rabbit hole, let's pause for a moment. The allure of life-changing experiences is undeniable. 
However, let's be wary of a potential logical pitfall lurking in the shadows. Here we encounter the post hoc ergo propter hoc fallacy once again. Just because someone undergoes a life-changing experience after a profound religious encounter doesn't necessarily mean the encounter caused the transformation. Imagine this. You buy a new lucky pen, and soon after, you win a game of Scrabble. Does that mean your pen is the secret to wordplay victory? Not quite. So while we acknowledge the transformative power of these experiences, we mustn't leap to conclusions about causation. The allure of post hoc reasoning can be as beguiling as a siren song, leading us away from the shores of sound logic. Premise 4, the grand finale of this quartet of assertions, an argument that hinges on the unity and consistency of these profound religious experiences. It suggests that because diverse individuals from all walks of life describe these experiences in simple terms, we should treat them as solemn evidence for the existence of a divine realm. Now, before we're swept away by the grandeur of this unity, let's steer our intellectual ship through potentially turbulent waters. Here we find ourselves at the shores of another argumentum ad populum, the appeal to popularity. Just because many people agree on something doesn't necessarily make it true. Remember when everyone thought the Earth was flat? Now we look at the Flat Earth Movement as some kind of joke. It's as if we're saying a multitude of people agree that cats can predict the weather, so it must be true. While consensus can be compelling, it is not always a reliable compass for navigating the vast sea of philosophical inquiry. So while we appreciate the consistency and unity of these reports, we must exercise caution. The siren's call of consensus can sometimes lead us astray. As we continue our journey through the maze of philosophical thought, we explore whether this unity is indeed the beacon it appears to be, or if it might be concealing hidden navigational challenges. Now let's bring in the heavy artillery, counter-arguments tailored to the formal form of the argument from religious experience. The evidential problem of evil serves as a potent counter-argument against the argument from religious experience by presenting a challenging question. If profound religious experiences reveal the existence of a benevolent and all-powerful deity, how do we reconcile that with the presence of suffering and evil in the world? In other words, while personal experiences may suggest the existence of a loving and omnipotent God, the existence of immense suffering and evil seems to contradict this notion. The evidential problem of evil argues that the sheer volume and intensity of suffering in the world raises serious doubts about the existence of such a God. So, when confronted with this counter-argument, proponents of the argument from religious experience must grapple with the profound question of how to harmonize their deeply personal encounters with the divine with the stark realities of suffering and evil. It highlights the complexity of reconciling individual religious experiences with the broader theological and philosophical challenges posed by the problem of evil. While the argument relies on personal encounters with the divine as evidence for the existence of a particular religious reality, the existence of vastly different religious experiences across various cultures and belief systems challenge this notion. This counter-argument raises the question, if profound religious experiences provide evidence for a specific religious truth, how do we account for the diversity of these experiences and the conflicting beliefs they give rise to? People from different religious backgrounds report experiences that contradict one another, suggesting that religious experiences may not necessarily point to a single universally valid religious reality. In essence, the existence of diverse religious experiences force proponents of the argument from religious experience to address the challenge of religious pluralism and the coexistence of vastly different religious claims. It emphasizes the need to consider the broader religious landscape when interpreting personal religious encounters, raising doubts about whether such experiences can conclusively validate a particular religious tradition. Many would suggest that the personal encounters with the divine might have natural, non-divine origins. These explanations propose that religious experiences can be understood through the lens of brain activity, psychology, and cognitive processes. This counter-argument challenges the assumption that personal experiences necessarily point to a transcendent reality. Instead, it suggests that the brain's intricate workings, coupled with psychological factors, could give rise to what individuals interpret as divine encounters. Again, proponents of the argument from religious experience must address another problem with their conclusion. That is, the possibility that their experiences may be explained by neurological and psychological phenomena rather than direct contact with the divine. This idea underscores the importance of considering naturalistic explanations and the need for a more comprehensive examination of personal religious experiences beyond a purely supernatural interpretation. And there you have it, an in-depth examination of the argument from religious experience in its strongest form. Upon investigation, we found that each premise contained at least one logical fallacy. Along with that, there are several counter-arguments you could use when people try to assert some form of personal experience with the divine. While these experiences are undoubtedly significant to those who undergo them, they may not be the smoking gun some claim them to be. It's up to you to weigh the evidence and decide for yourself. The debate rages on, but one thing is certain. It is a fascinating journey through the realms of logic and wit.
With that, I would like to give a personal thanks to my patrons, Longhaired Lefty, Musical Ocelot, Jammin' Bomb, and Kai Henningsen, who are the explanation for the experience you're having right now. If you would like to have a personal experience with my exclusive content, you can join them for as low as a dollar a month at patreon.com front slash dark of all trades. And remember to keep questioning, keep exploring, and as always, keep learning.